The next item of business is a debate on motion 8497 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on the promotion of active travel in Scotland. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to, debate even, to press the request to speak buttons now. And I, we are a bit pushed for time, uh, so I call on Hamza Yousaf to speak to and move the motion up to 12 minutes, please, Minister. I'm delighted, presiding officer, to speak to and uh, move uh, the motion in my name on behalf of the government. Uh, I'm delighted this morning, presiding officer, to have attended Cycling Scotland's uh, conference today. Over 200 people enthusiastic, inspired uh, about active travel. Uh, I would also, as Transport Minister, since being appointed, delighted to not only talk the talk, but as we're talking about active travel, walk uh, the walk. I was going to say pedal the pedal. It doesn't quite fit, but I think members uh, understand where I'm going uh, with it. I was delighted uh, this year to do Pedal for Scotland for the first time. In fact, being told today by Cycling Scotland I'm the first ever Transport Minister to have completed um, uh, Pedal for Scotland. I, I won't tell you uh, where my other colleagues and predecessors stopped at, uh, but nonetheless delighted to have completed it. Not only myself, this was a cross-party endeavour. I think my colleague Liam Kerr and the Conservative benches and uh, uh, and indeed, Graham Simpson, I think, uh, completed Pedal for Scotland uh, this year, both of them uh, getting a better time than I did, uh, presiding officer. Um, I was also delighted just a couple of weeks ago to take part in my first ever 70 mile cycle from Glasgow to the Kelpies and back. Um, a word of advice uh, for anybody, if you're ever going to cycle back from the Kelpies to Glasgow, don't do it on a day where a storm is going to approach. Uh, the headwind uh, took me six hours uh, to get back. But anyway, nonetheless, Enough about uh, me and my cycling endeavours and back to the motion uh, at hand. The government's commitment to active travel, cycling and, and walking uh, has been demonstrated by the First Minister's commitments in the programme for government. Uh, the headline uh, and that, of course, the doubling uh, of the active travel budget from 40 to 80 million. And I'll talk more about the programme for government. But perhaps before doing so, uh, I should speak about why that investment in active travel uh, is so vital. Uh, the act of travel, of course, has very obvious physical benefits. You could reel, reel off stats after stats after stats, maybe just a couple uh, to mention. Uh, those that cycle to work, they show there is a link to 45% uh, lower uh, rates of cancer and 46% uh, lower uh, in terms of cardiovascular issues. Uh, one, that's, one of the benefits of active travel that's less talked about is the benefits of mental on mental health as well. I was delighted to be able to visit a project in Inverness, a Velocity Cafe, uh, where it dealt with uh, helping people with mental health uh, issues in particular. There was one uh, lady there who, before coming to Velocity, uh, she was afraid to go out the house uh, due to her mental health condition, didn't, uh, was very isolated, didn't uh, mix with, uh, and didn't uh, engage with others. Uh, having come to Velocity, she'd never ridden a bike, she'd learned how to ride a bike, she had the physical health benefits of it, uh, the mental health benefits of it. Not only did she learn to cycle, but she, did she was leading uh, one of the cycle teams as well. So sometimes understated, but the benefits on mental health, uh, I think, are important to state on the record uh, in this debate uh, as well. Uh, climate change uh, as well, in terms of a reduction of CO2 emissions, there's no doubt at all that active travel uh, can uh, play its part. It may be a small part in the wider uh, transport picture, but I think uh, still every bit uh, most certainly counts. So active travel can play uh, a part in our very ambitious uh, climate change uh, targets that we have. And then there's a social inclusion element uh, as well. Um, and I welcome the, the Labour amendment in, in, in that respect in relation to the Sustrans report, uh, which I think uh, made for uh, difficult reading, but also important reading uh, for the government and stakeholders. Uh, but the, one of the key statistics uh, out of that report that I pulled out was that 67, 61% excuse me, of, of, of those in high risk areas are within 10 minute bike ride or a half an hour walk of essential and vital services, be that GP clinics, job centres and other vital services. Now, that doesn't mean that transport poverty in itself will be overcome simply by uh, cycling and walking, but it can be a key part uh, of uh, that mix. And on top of cycling, we shouldn't uh, forget that walking is an important part uh, as well. I mean, off that, again, often overlooked in, in active travel, but uh, walking and the benefits of walking uh, I think uh, uh, tick all of those uh, boxes that I've spoken about uh, as well. In fact, I had uh, Sir Alex Ferguson recently uh, in my uh, constituency in Govan opening a walkway and a pathway, and he himself uh, said that uh, the best uh, exercise he could ever give to his players uh, over the years uh, was to get them walking 
uh, more. So if uh, the, 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 the world's uh, greatest uh, uh, football manager, club manager after Jock Steen uh, can say such a thing, <laughs> then uh, I think it's worth advice uh, worth listening to. Um, in terms of uh, the radical shift to get more of a population engaged in active travel, I think the programme for government, uh, this was central to the programme uh, for, for government, if I can say a little bit more uh, about the First Minister's commitments uh, during that. On top of the doubling of um, active travel budget, which shouldn't be uh, understated, uh, I'm sure it isn't actually, and I know it was very welcomed by the stakeholders at the conference uh, this morning. This is a first for the UK, and Scotland is very much leading uh, in terms of the financial contribution, the doubling of that budget, uh, and, uh, and uh, rightly uh, being lauded for it. But increasing the active travel budget is one thing. How to make sure we get the best bang for that buck is going to take the advice, the considerations uh, of those around this chamber, but of course of stakeholders, uh, academics uh, and experts uh, as well. Of course. Richard Lockhead. Uh, can I thank the Minister for giving way and on that note of the benefits of doubling the budget for active travel and speaking as one veteran of Pedal of Scot for Scotland to another, and as a self-confessed mammal, a middle-aged man in Lycra, uh, can I welcome the Minister's comments about the benefits of cycling for health and also for tourism. Uh, I've seen those signs in Murray where there's an increase in popularity of cycling in particular uh, in recent years. It has been put to me that perhaps Transport Scotland could do more to be focused on cycling to make the most of that increased budget. And I wonder if the Minister would be willing to consider creating a unit within Transport Scotland dedicated to promoting cycling in Scotland uh, and working with our local authorities. Hamza Youssef. I thank the mammal, I mean the member for uh, his uh, contribution uh, there. I think he, he touched on a serious point that again was raised this morning at the conference I was at, that expertise are needed within government, within local government uh, and indeed other uh, public agencies and even in the private sector of course to help facilitate uh, an increase in active travel. <coughs> so we'll know of course we have officials already uh, within cycling but his idea which he has mentioned to me previously I can say has been given some very very serious consideration in terms of a cycling unit. Uh, within, within Transport uh, Scotland. Uh, back to uh, what I was saying, if I can, about the programme uh, for government. Uh, we want to be the leaders in the UK uh, on active travel. That is uh, very much uh, our ambition. Our vision is to make our towns and cities friendlier and safer places for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, and to start that process, I announced in September that all five Community Links Plus projects would receive 50% match funding. That was two projects in Edinburgh, uh, a second one uh, in Glasgow, one each in Stirling. Uh, and Inverness. All of these projects will deliver high quality segregated cycle paths. They will improve the public realm, making it as accessible as possible for everyone. The projects will put people and places first with behavioural change and education programmes also being delivered. Uh, they will ensure that people of Scotland see walking and cycling as an attractive everyday option for shorter journeys. Uh, I'll also, we will, we've also committed, uh, of course, uh, was to, uh, to appoint an active nation commissioner in early 2018 to ensure that we deliver world-class infrastructure uh, across Scotland um, and projects to encourage greater physical activity levels such as road user training and access to bike hire. We will also promote e-mobility and the use of electric and cargo bikes for businesses and for projects which help older people, young families and people with disabilities uh, to benefit from a network of routes. We will step up our work with partners and with communities to ensure that active travel helps address challenges as I've already touched upon in regards to transport poverty. For example, I've already asked uh, Fourth Environment Link uh, and ScotRail to provide us with options for providing free bike hire uh, to those uh, seeking work. The key thread throughout all of this, uh, throughout all the programme for government commitments and the commitments that we've made previous to that is collaboration. Collaboration is going to be key with our stakeholders, but I think vitally importantly at local uh, authority level. We'll be hosting a summit on the 7th of November uh, with the council uh, councillors that are spokespeople for transport and their administrations and also with the chief officers uh, of transport uh, at local authorities and the RTPs uh, will be there uh, as well. That will be to align, I hope, local uh, and national priorities around active travel. But some of the things that we're looking to align uh, and we're also examining and exploring through the active travel task force are uh, behavioural change. I think all of us realise that behavioural change is going to be key uh, to get more people engaged in cycling uh, and in walking. Now, that behavioural change takes many different aspects. I won't go into all of them. But, for example, we know that in cycling, uh, taking one example, there is a, a drop-off of cycle rates between primary school and high school. There's a number of different uh, factors for that. Longer journeys is one of them. Uh, teenagers wanting to walk together, uh, to talk as they go towards school. There might even be things around uh, not getting your hair messed up with a helmet. 
and so on and so forth. So the behavioral change uh, in, in, in that uh, age group is important. Behavioral change also amongst drivers, hugely, hugely important. Many of us uh, that cycle are also drivers, uh, road uh, car users uh, as well. And too often, I'm sure, we've heard uh, the attitude, unsavory attitude, of some uh, car uh, users. So behavioral change uh, is going to be hugely, hugely uh, important. Uh, the, another big driver to getting more people more active on our roads, uh, of course, will also be uh, making our roads safer. <coughs> I've, been no, I've, not, I've never been hesitant uh, to put on record uh, my uh, belief that uh, more segregated cycle paths uh, can only be a good thing, can only encourage more people uh, to get on our roads, to give confidence uh, to those who want to cycle, uh, to cycle, whether they're young or whether or not uh, so young. Uh, that also uh, applies uh, for, at a national level uh, as well when I talk about uh, road infrastructure. Road infrastructure uh, at the local level, of course, is important, but clearly important for us uh, as a government uh, as well. So we're hoping to uh, take forward uh, integration of walking and cycling paths into our national infrastructure. For example, our drilling projects in the A9 and the A96 will provide walking and cycling routes uh, on these trunk roads. Uh, there's also already a commitment in the PFG regarding the 35 kilometres of cycle track on the A9, which is uh, the more developed of the two uh, drilling projects. And we're consulting with communities along these two routes, and we'll do all we can to give people uh, what they need in terms of confidence for cycling and walking. Sheriff Hall uh, in Edinburgh is another example where Transport Scotland uh, has listened and will deliver what local communities need, uh, provision for non-motorised users at Sheriff Hall, uh, including cyclists, is currently being developed uh, in dialogue with uh, a number of organisations like Spokes uh, and Sustrans. I'd like to reassure you that we're taking into account the views of these groups alongside the wider public uh, as well. And finally, as part of the programme for government, touching upon a point that Richard Lockhead uh, has already uh, made, we'll deliver a long-distance walking and cycling route to match the North Coast 500 for people to be able to enjoy the scenery of our beautiful country through activity. This route or routes will stimulate local economies through increased tourism, health benefits through increased physical activity, and put Scotland on the map uh, for being a healthy uh, and welcoming uh, nation. Uh, what I would say uh, as well, uh, presiding officer on top of the national infrastructure, clearly modal shift uh, is hugely important. Not just modal shift, uh, but integration uh, of transport uh, as well. And many members uh, across the chamber have spoken to me uh, about the railways and what more we can do uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the railways infrastructure, uh, helping and encouraging uh, active travel as well. Abellio uh, have, in the first two years, delivered 1,269 cycle parking spaces. Uh, there are many other plans, I'm sure, uh, that uh, members uh, will be aware of. Uh, in terms of high-speed trains, which I know has been an issue, uh, eight cycle spaces uh, for bikes as well. Uh, generally speaking, I'm planning often to conclude uh, on this point, collaboration is going to be key. Uh, we're going to be listening to the views that members have across the chamber in terms of how we can best use that money. But I'm confident that with the action that we take, the collaboration that we take forward, uh, that uh, we'll get more people cycling, more people walking, and our nation will be healthier and better for it. We are close for time. Uh, I'm going to have to take time off some of the speeches, but meanwhile, I call Jamie Green to speak to and move Amendment 8497.2. No more than seven minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, Deb's presiding officer. Uh, may I start uh, with something I don't do very often in the chamber, and that's start with an apology to the minister. Uh, I woke up in a rather enlightened mood this morning and retrospectively considered my amendment today. Uh, whilst there are some very relevant and valid points to be made in it and to consider, my colleagues will uh, go through some of these, uh, I would like to start with a positive. Uh, we on these benches welcome the Scottish Government's plans to promote active travelling. We believe that it is a vital component in not just reducing carbon emissions but also in tackling health issues such as obesity, but as well as promoting affordable and accessible forms of transport. We do therefore welcome the appointment of an active nation commissioner. This seems like a very sensible idea and one that we can support. Uh, our only ask is that the role of this commissioner is clear and that the objectives and measurable outcomes are part and parcel of this role. We would also expect that this new position should be charged with ensuring that every penny of the proposed active travel budget is spent sensibly and wisely and with the right balance and mix of projects and investments that will ultimately help the government meet, meet its objectives. So there is my concession on that. Our amendment didn't address this appointment, but be assured that the new commissioner will have the support of these benches in the task before him or her. Uh, in the last Holyrood election, the Scottish Conservatives stood on an explicit manifesto promise to promote active travel in Scotland. 
Active travel, as we know, when properly promoted and facilitated, has countless health and social benefits, many of which will be discussed over the course of this afternoon's debate. But our amendment today makes reference to a number of issues surrounding the current plan, which I'd like to explore. The four main points in our amendment are around progress, funding, collaboration and infrastructure. Starting off, so on the progress front, we feel that insufficient progress has been made. Now, it's true that Scotland is a diverse country with very differing travelling needs. And it's also fair to say that the weather isn't always kind to us, as active travel invariably means more walking and cycling. But these should come as no great surprise to anyone who chooses to face the elements and opt for a healthier commute to work or school. If, for example, we look at the cycling action plan laid out by the government in 2010, at the current rate, the Scottish government will not meet their 2020 target of ensuring that 10% of all journeys are made by bicycle. Uh, Transport Scotland's own reports show that cycling as a mode of transport to work sits at just over 2%, so we're quite some way off the 10% target. The 2013 uh, Cycling Action Plan for Scotland set some admirable ambitions, but uh, so-called everyday bike rides has increased by just 0.2% in a decade. So at the current rate of increase, the 10% target will indeed be met in 300 years. And by then, I suspect we'll be taking hovercrafts to work instead. In fact, today, national statistics show that people are shifting back to the car, and this is worrying. But the main reasons given are that the length of their journeys were far too far to walk or cycle. But secondly, there's a perception there are too many cars on the road. So there's very little been progress been made in the psychology behind modal shift, and that has not been addressed in the government's motion today. The second point we'd like to make is around funding. Absolutely, funding plays a fundamental role in the success of this policy. And whilst we do welcome the government's commitment today to increase funding by 40 million pounds in the coming financial year, it is important to see how we got to where we are today. In 2010, the active travel budget was 35.7 million pounds. This reduced to 29 million pounds in 2014 and down to 25 million pounds by 2015. Uh, in, in the current uh, financial year, uh, the budget sits at around a real terms cut of 8% since 10%. So again, whilst today's budget today announced is very welcome, it has to be noticed that this is a somewhat knee-jerk knee, knee reaction to the fact that all the warnings are pointing to us being way off target. We will be seeking greater, greater clarity on how targeted and effective this additional funding will be, which specific projects it will be put towards to, and we will be monitoring the success or otherwise of that spend. The devil is very much in the detail. But funding isn't everything. I was pleased to hear the Minister speak in his opening remarks around the important point of collaboration. A key driver in ensuring the success of this plan will be better collaboration. Uh, if it's very brief. Bruce Crawford. My understanding is that funding for actual travel has actually increased year on year, even prior to the announcement from the, the Minister. Your, your amendment seems to suggest that more money needs to go into this area. If, if, this, if, the, if that's the case, how much and where's it coming from? Jamie Green. I, I think I've already welcomed the increase that the Minister has made of 40 million. Mm -hmm. And all I'm asking for is some greater clarity on where we spent. Uh, it is fair to say that the, gov the, the active travel budget has been cut uh, year on year uh, in the last uh, 10 years. And those are, I believe, according to Spice figures, happy to check them after the debate. <clears throat> on collaboration, uh, government, Transport Scotland, local authorities and local communities must, must work together uh, to ensure the success of the government's plans. In a 2016 Transport Scotland's review of active travel report, it highlighted a lack of liaison in a number of cases. I will quote from that report. It says, the Scottish government does not rigorous, rigorously check whether schemes accord with its own or local policies and does not commonly ad advocate good outcomes for active travel in local decision making. Local interest and capacity is essential to generate effective community led schemes. Uh, in contrast, planning officer, the UK government has created an active transport policy which has uh, uh, very much centred around a uh, community uh, basis. Up to £1 billion of funding for cycling walking projects has been made available to local bodies. And this way, local communities can themselves identify which projects would be the most effective rather than central government taking all the decisions. <clears throat> uh, the Scottish Conservatives have also been calling for safe travel routes to schools. 
Uh, we've also been uh, asking for one segregated cycle route in each of our cities, and I hope that's something the Minister will take on board, and indeed calling for greater collaboration between government, local authorities, and the third sector. Uh, in terms of the amendments today, we're very happy to support Labour's amendment. Uh, they make a very valid point around transport poverty, and the government uh, is welcome to offer more detail as to how this additional funding might target that. The Lib Dem amendment also points out the importance of cycling from a very early age, and we're happy to uh, support that as well. We're unable to support the Green Amendment today, as we do not think that a predefined or fixed amount dedicated in the budget to active travel uh, is the best way to approach it. We do believe that government needs flexibility in that, so unfortunately we're unable to support that amendment. Uh, I do uh, move the amendment in my name, and I hope I can rely on the support of other parties today. Thank you. I now call Neil Bibby to speak to and move Amendment 8497.4. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government's motion quite rightly recognises the work that is taking place across communities, across government and across political parties to develop the active travel agenda. The vision of communities shaped around people where we have the confidence to make healthier choices and walk or cycle for more of our regular journeys we make every day is a vision that the Minister uh, talked at length and is a vision that we share, a vision for better health, a more active population living less sedentary lives, exercising and out and about more in the community. For the places we live and work, more livable communities, uh, better pedestrian access and cycling facilities and more footfall in our town centres. For our environment, better air quality, modal shift away from cars and a reduction in vehicle emissions. But, President Officer, the active nation we want to build must be a fairer nation too. Members will be aware of the research by Sustrans into the concept of transport poverty. There may be different measures of transport poverty, but there is a widespread acceptance that being unable to access transport or afford transport limits people's choices and their opportunities in life. And unfortunately, right now, President Officer, the Scottish Government's big idea when it comes to transport is to cut air passenger duty that will benefit the wealthiest frequent flying few and do nothing to tackle transport poverty. And, the, and that cost is projected to be over £190 million pounds in that tax cut, money that could and should be invested elsewhere, particularly in other transport initiatives. And they have, uh, government have also failed over the last 10 years to regulate Scotland's bus services, refused to back Labour's call for a fare freeze on railways, and will still not rule out raising the eligibility criteria um, for the free bus pass. It has to be said, President Officer, that instead of addressing transport policy, this government too often makes decisions that make it worse. In the report, Sustrans produced an analysis of factors such as income, car ownership, and access to services through public transport. The analysis placed over a million people in data zones where there is a high risk of transport poverty. Active travel, as the Minister has said, can address those risks an affordable alternative to other, more expensive modes of transport. The Labour Amendment addresses the issue of transport poverty head on and calls on the Scottish Government to set out specifically what measures will be taken to reduce transport poverty. We welcome the increase in funding from £40 million to £80 million, but the Scottish Government and, Minister, and the Minister must ensure that this budget is used to tackle transport poverty. Because in the uh, according to Transport Scotland's own statistics, it shows that uh, people from the least deprived area are 20% more likely to own a bike than those from the most deprived. And the Scottish Government should also consider ensuring that tackling poverty and inequality forms part of the remit for the new Active Nation Commissioner. Funding allocated for the active tra travel previously has been match funded by local authorities. Yet council budgets are under sustained pressure. Since 2011, 1.5 billion has been cut from local government budgets. Fraser Valander Institute anticipate further cuts to non-protected areas of spending, ranging from 9 to 14 per cent by the end of the parliament. And local authorities have told me, and they may have told the minister, that if things continue as they are, then councils will be unable to match uh, the funding. I'll take an intervention from the, from the minister on that. Hamza Yousaf. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I thank the member for giving uh, way. He'll notice that I acknowledge that uh, we'll be accepting the Labour uh, amendment because of the wider issues on transport poverty. Well, the local authority, you know, what he's saying doesn't necessarily always reflect uh, or bear to ring true 
in that Glasgow City Council, new administration, I should say, in place, have committed 10% of their budget over the, over the course of the council administration. And, uh, of course, uh, SNP-led Edinburgh City Council are doing the same. So local authorities are, some are leading by example. Would the member not agree that other local authorities should look to them to see uh, what more they can do? Neil Pepe. There are good examples of local authorities and uh, Labour local authorities and the SNP local authorities as well, where they prioritised um, active travel. But specifically on the increase in funding from 40 to 80 million pounds, local authorities have told me, and I'm sure they've told the Minister, that the, 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 the match funding criteria will put at risk them bidding for potential funding. And I, I would encourage the Minister to look at that because good projects must not be dropped because councils cannot afford the match funding requirement. And I, and I hope the Minister will look at that. Um, councils should be properly supported to play their part in the active nation agenda is councils that will be responsible for clearing streetscapes to make them more accessible. Uh, they'll be delivering the active travel projects on the ground, responsible for the upkeep and investment in local road networks. And make no mistake, investment is needed. And just last week, according to the Society of Chief Officers of Transport in Scotland, they've said there's a 1.6 billion backlog in road repairs. And it'll be impossible that for them to clear the backlog within existing budgets. And that figure does not include pavements that will concern motorists of course but it will also concern cyclists because potholes are more of a nuisance uh, and a risk to their uh, bike and to their own personal safety uh, finally presiding officer i want to stress the importance of integrated uh, transport the government's aspiration is that by 2030 walking and cycling will become the most popular modes of travel for shorter journeys for longer journeys on public transport more and more passengers will come to expect secure bike parking facilities at bus and train stations and they'll come to expect that more buses and trains should carry bikes. Modal shift towards cycling for many people is about behavioural change but it's also about ensuring there are adequate facilities to help people make the choice uh, to cycle and that was one of the key points of the National Cycle Action Plan. President officer there will be a consensus around many of the issues we are discussing today. We share the aspiration that Scotland should be an active nation. What is important is that this debate about active travel does not take place in isolation. There is a link between active travel and addressing the health inequalities and transport poverty we see in our society. The Labour Amendment makes that clear and it demands action and I move the, the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call John Finney to speak to and move Amendment 8497.3. No more than six minutes, please, Mr Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. And I, I do move the amendment in my name. And that amendment sets out our long-standing, and indeed many people's long-standing ambition, uh, who want to see safer, healthier streets um, and for 10% of the transport budget to be spent on walking and cycling. Now, we know that 25% of all journeys are by foot or bike. Yet currently, the Scottish Government budget uh, has 1.6% spent on walking and cycling. And it's very important we get this right for a number of reasons, and, and I'm sure the Minister will recognise this. The rising cost to the NHS um, caused by air pollution, for instance, and by inactivity. And we did hear in that, uh, earlier in the, the chamber here, it would be interesting to hear the feedback from Cabinet Secretary Cunningham on the issue of low emission zones, because that's certainly something that we need to make progress on, not simply for the uh, question of health, but also reducing congestion and making our roads safer is very important. Now, we've been working very hard on a, a members of the Green Party on a, a, a new policy, and that's been developed in consultation with disability groups, traffic engineers and walking and cycling campaigners. And that's all with an aim to aligning Scotland with other more progressive uh, EU countries in respect of transport, such as Denmark and the Netherlands. And it's thanks to decades of investment in active uh, uh, travel there that we, these countries have some of the fittest and happiest populations in the world. Now, building on that, yes, indeed. Mike Rumbles. There's a concern with the development of the green transport policy that if you put 10% of the transport budget for walking and cycling, it could possibly put public transport at risk. Could you address that issue for us, please? John Finney. Well, it's, it's all part of a package. The member uh, will recognise that he's a member of a party, as are all the other parties in here. We're very happy at spending six billion on two roads, simply by spending six billion on two roads, whom we've heard from Neil Bibby from the Labour Party at the backlog of uh, uh, repairs. So the Scottish Green Party isn't against spending on road infrastructures, but what we would do is we would maintain and perhaps upgrade some of them rather than have these uh, vanity projects that the other parties seem very keen on. 
So it is a, an overall package that needs to be considered. And I was going to come on to the issue of uh, safety and talk about uh, my colleague Mark Ruskell's member's bill now, and that's to have a default speed limit in built-up areas of 20 miles per hour. That was a, a, a very well uh, re responded to consultation. Over 2,000 people responded, 80% support that, and been overwhelmingly welcomed by families, schools, and indeed community groups. And that's simply because people want streets where they live and work and play to be safe and pleasant places. Um, people have suffered the blight of pollution and danger caused by high traffic levels of traffic. And key to that is planning policy, and we have a planning bill coming up later in the year, and I'm sure that will have a factor. I want to pick up on a, a point that my colleague Bruce Crawford made there, because, of course, it is about the percentage, the overall per percentage, and, and if the, the increase in tra um, the budget is, is welcome. But it is about the overall percentage of the transport budget. And, and that actually went from 1.1% in 2013 to a commendable almost doubled in the next year. But last year it was down to 1.6%. So the progress is welcome. Um, and uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, in summing up, the Minister can clarify the programme for government aspect of whether that will be maintained. Um, in the short time I have av available, I want to talk on the issue of, of walking and how difficult it is to calculate, as, as, uh, um, and local authorities are mainly responsible for the infrastructure, and uh, it's acknowledged that there are grants available, um, uh, but uh, they're being used for a wide range of sustainable transport projects, and I, 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 I spend an exact figure on walking. I'm, finding it difficult to, to, to get a source to. And of course, there's always conflict with, with, with everything and um, had representations from the ramblers about the meddling of um, paths when there's multi-use for that and uh, what's seen as uh, uh, intrusion into the green space because of that. Of course, the actual um, spend on cycling, um, again, is a, a, a complex issue. And indeed, the annual survey which Spokes undertook was discontinued in 2015 due to the increasing um, complexity of compiling it. Um, we, we talk about the household survey and the percentage of journeys taken by walking bike and there is some encouraging news. I want to, to, to talk about the improvements in figures for travel to school by cycling. The number of child casualties has plunged. The uh, distances travelled by bikes is in an upwards trend and to be parochial for a minute, 2.5% 2, 2 of people in Highland Council area uh, report being um, their bike being a, their main mode of transport, second highest percentage in Scotland and across the Highlands and Islands. This will perhaps surprise people, the, the figure is 1.9%. Now today the Minister announced um, uh, funding for what we refer to as the Mad Mile. This is a stretch of road across a Greenbelt area in Inverness which at peak times will take motorists 12 seconds um, quicker between two points. That's not a sustainable position, and I alluded to the A9, A96 as well, and it's interesting, it'd be interesting to hear how that contributes to, to active travel. In the very short time I've left there, I want to uh, say that we will be supporting the Labour mo motion. I think it's uh, commendable that it's addressing the issue of transport poverty, and certainly in relation to the a APD, the, the sum of money there could be much better spent, we would acknowledge that. The Lib Dem talks about equipment, and one of the things we should be equipping people with is knowledge and attitudes, because there are tensions between the various groups, and what I would plead for is courtesy, courtesy for um, pedestrians, for cyclists, for motorists, for people on horses, to remove these tensions. And there are, of course, challenges too, and the challenges are, in rural areas, um, uh, the speed of vehicles. So if we can get um, goods onto heavy, uh, from heavy goods vehicles onto rail, and again, not some positive news in the last couple of days about that, um, that would be a big help. I want to conclude by commending a, a constituent, Mr. Robert Phillips, who gives us all a very fine example. He commutes between home mains uh, um, and the outskirts of Inverness and Inverness by kayak on a daily basis. Now, it's not an option that's available to all of us, but maybe we need to have a wee look at what we can do. Thank you very much. I now call Mike Rumbles to speak to and move amendment 8497.1. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The fact that the Scottish Government has announced a doubling of the active travel budget in this year's programme for government is very welcome. Uh, boosting the number of people cycling would be a win-win for Scotland, and the Scottish Government recognised this as far back as when Stuart Stevenson was Transport Minister in 2009. Back then, the number of journeys taken by bike was 1% of all journeys. And Stuart Stevenson said that the government's target was for 10% of journeys to be taken by bike by 2020. Now, Stuart Stevenson said at the time that this 10% target was, and I quote, an ambitious target, 
but one I believe is achievable. We are now just three years away from the date the target was to be reached. And how have we done? Well, the percentage of journeys taken by bike has moved from 1%, by some figures to 1.2 or some to 2% in the last eight years. The warm words of Scottish ministers, as in so many other areas, have not been matched by the reality. It is more than time to move up the gears. As well as increasing the share of the transport budget that is spent on cycling and active transport, the Scottish Government must ensure that safe provision for cyclists and pedestrians is built into the transport system and that people feel confident to cycle from an early age. Countries across Europe have shown that this is possible. The Scottish Liberal Democrats believe the case for increasing the uptake of cycling is compelling and it is increasing in schools. And one practical way of doing that is by ensuring that every school child, every school child should have the opportunity to benefit from cycle training. Hence our amendment to the government's motion today, which by the way, I do move. Um, we are not prescriptive as to how each child should be given that opportunity. We're not prescriptive about it, but we are clear that this should happen. And I would like the minister to perhaps address that in the, in the summing up. Increasing cycling has a huge potential to benefit people's health, tackle obesity, ease congestion, and it will contribute to meeting Scotland's climate change targets. Cycling can also help boost our economy too, because lifestyle is taken into account by people and companies when making choices about where they live and where they locate, locate to. However, despite the surge of interest in cycling in recent years, driven, I think, in part by sporting successes, participation in cycling remains a minority pursuit. We need action to increase investment in both cycling and walking to improve dedicated cycling infrastructure to ensure that people are confident that they can ride their bikes safely put, and put cycling at the heart of our planning processes. Now, I do want to return to the government's target of getting 10% of all journeys to be made by bike. All parties in this chamber support this target. But I have to say that the Scottish Government simply hasn't shown the strong, effective and sustained leadership over the years that is required to meet this target. And I note, in relative terms, the, 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 the Transport Minister hasn't been in his job for that long, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get sustained leadership in this field. It was recently confirmed that the proportion of journeys taken by bike is now lower than it was in 2011. At this rate, we will never achieve the government's target, and I have to disagree with Jamie Green. I don't think it will take 300 years at this rate. At this rate, we will never achieve it. Meanwhile, what are the government's other transport priorities? It's been mentioned by Labour, it's wished to half air passenger duty would cost up to £125 million in lost revenues, and it's aimed to entirely abolish it up to 250 million. Some dispute about the figures, but it's effectively about the same. Just think what could be done with even a small part of such resources if they were directed towards active travel instead. So, what do we need to do to make cycling a more effective option for most people? Not only do we need more investment in dedicated cycling infrastructure, but we need to ensure that people feel confident that they can cycle safely. I've mentioned this a few times now because it's a really important issue. Research in 2015 found that only 62% of Edinburgh residents, for instance, felt safe riding a bike during the day, falling to just 34% after dark. Presiding officer, I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll keep this short. We need real action, I mean real action, rather than warm words from the Scottish Government to tackle these issues. That isn't just moving up a gear, but we need to see real leadership from the Scottish Government if we are ever to get even close to achieving the 10% target set for journeys by bike. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. We now move to the open debate speeches. And aside from Mr. Rumbles, all the other opening speakers went over their allocated time. This will have an effect on open debate speakers. And up to five minutes, please, I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Brian Whittle. Officer, the advantages of active travel are well documented. Positive implications for the nation's health, economy, and quite staggering benefits for the environment. And our actual happiness, which is something that I don't think we talk enough about in this chamber or in life generally. One of the absolute treats 
for me of living in Edinburgh three days a week is the fact that for the first time in 20 years there's a working woman I can walk to work come rain or shine I get the trainers on and I walk into Holyrood sets me up for the day 20 years of sitting in horrible Aberdeen traffic has made me very grateful for that all those wonderful benefits are obvious and I hugely welcome any government investment in active travel and indeed the certain local authorities that uh, Mr Yusuf has mentioned in, in his uh, intervention uh, earlier um, because more people walking and cycling will not happy if there happen if there's not more investment and inventive innovation in existing projects whether brand new or improvement based because safety is a major reason why people, many people who want to walk or cycle still don't. And a lot of safety concerns can be addressed through infrastructure. Safe routes to school are tremendously important. Every child should be able to walk safely or cycle to school if they don't qualify for school transport. I was quite evangelical about my children walking to school, even if sometimes they weren't. But then if I stood outside my house, I could pretty much watch them until they reached the school gates, so I was lucky. And I have, I admit, in the past been quite judgmental about parents who rock up in a 4x4 four four to the school gates, who I know don't live that much further away than I did. Walking to school from an early age is good for a child's health and a child's development, particularly when you give them the trust to do it alone or with friends, I would argue. But I'm now... As an elected member, I get many emails from parents who don't feel it's safe enough to let their child walk or cycle to school. <laughs> Narrow pavements or non-existing pa existent pavements are a common theme. Large commercial vehicles going through residential areas is another. All the same, every local authority must ensure, ensure that a child has a safe route to school with crossings and assistance at crossings if required and pavements lining that route. But for cycling, I'd argue that we're nowhere near where we need to be in this regard, particularly in rural locations. Cycle paths or marked off paths and pavements for bikes are rare in rural towns and villages. And I'm hoping that a large part of the active travel money will be addressing this. I'd also like to see local authorities build cycling provision into every new pathway or be taken into account when maintenance of exi existing pavements or pathways is undertaken whenever possible. In my recent visit to the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route under construction, I was pleased to see routes for cyclists joining up existing paths over and under the new highway. I also think it's great that Sandra White has highlighted in the past parking on pavements as a concern, and I'm glad to hear that stopping this practice is under consideration in the forthcoming Transport Bill. Cars parking on pavements and across cycleways are a scourge for cyclists, wheelchair users and those with young children trying to get to their destination. Again, my email box is uh, very full of that kind of complaint. I agreed with much of Transfor Transform Scotland's submission to us MSPs before this debate, but I felt it was heavy on improvement to un urban environments and doesn't really address rural issues in the same way. I absolutely agree 100% that low emission zones are an important priority and encouraging more cycling and walking in cities is not just desirable, but essential. But we must be aware that much of the traffic is commuter traffic from rural areas, mine included. In Aberdeenshire, links between towns and cities are still sorely wanting for those who want to be active and those who want to leave the car at home but encounter difficulties. There's only one train station in my constituency and it's on the edge of it. Anyone wanting to cycle or walk partway into work study or study place in Aberdeen City will either have to walk or cycle wholesale or take the buses which, in my view, um, are still far too expensive in my area. I once cycled into work at the college that I worked at. The Martin Buchan cycle path was wonderful. It got me to Dyson, the edge of the city, in no time at all. But from there, cycle path provision was intermittent and I had to join busy highways. It was counterintuitive to the direction I was travelling, which is a complicated way of saying I was sent all over the place in my attempt to get to the city centre. Um, the traffic was terrifying and I never attempted it again. My journey around the Mount Hooley roundabout was like a chapter in a Stephen King novella. I only lived three miles from Aberdeen city boundaries. You'd have thought that cycling to work would be a breeze, and I never did it again. And I'm not one of the ones that we need to convince to give it a try. We need to ensure the experience is a good one and a safe one. A joined up approach is needed. We need to link the urban and the rural, and we always need to be thinking about why people would not opt to walk or cycle. And I'd say safety is right at the top of that list. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as anyone who has ever heard me speak in this chamber on more or less any subject will tell you, 
I'm a great believer in the benefits of physical activity as a way of improving public health. The principle behind active travel, that's getting people out of their cars and encouraging walking and cycling, is one I think all sides of this chamber wholeheartedly support. And the preventable agenda is one I think we should be uh, very much at the forefront of all our ambitions. In terms of cycling, I think, uh, as has just been mentioned, I think early intervention by promoting cycling to and from school uh, is really important, and that is going to require the need to deliver the this, this safe routes to do that. And speaking as a parent, uh, I'd be only too happy to let my youngest child uh, cycle to school, but there's no way I'm going to let her uh, if it involves cycling on busy main roads. And I think most children, given half the chance, are quite happy to walk or run or cycle or scoot or skate to school. Uh, but that can only happen if parents are confident that it can be done safely. So creating those safe travel zones around school, uh, which can be applied anywhere uh, in towns and cities and villages to give those kids that safe route to school, has to be a priority. And we must make that, that objective a priority when planning schools and the surrounding Ayrshire, uh, areas. Uh, in East Ayrshire, there is a park and stride initiative, which is getting parents to drop children off a few hundred yards from school entrance through the use of identified drop-off and pick-up places and giving them a safe route between them and the school. And, and there are a number of uh, known barriers to cycling and to achieve the kind of increases in active travel that we want to see. I think we need to address them all. And one of, them, one of the first ones, of course, is distance. And most people are never going to be persuaded to set off at 5.30 in the morning. Obviously, Richard Lockhart and Liam Kerr aside, clad in their high-vis lycra and cycle to work. So public transport has a key role to play in making active travel sustainable. Provision of bike storage pay, space on trains, as I'm sure Liam Kerr will go on to in more detail. Access to hire bikes at railway stations. We have active travel hubs, hubs such as the one in Kilmarnock railway station are great examples of what can be done. So splitting travel between biking and public transport that cycling to, to the station where perhaps there's secure bike storage or the space on trains, take the train to the city, walk or cycle to the office. And in road safety, has, as uh, Mr Yusuf uh, uh, um, alluded to earlier on, when we're sharing that road with other road users, that relationship between cyclists and drivers can sometimes be an uneasy one. And it's important we continue to develop a network of cycle lanes that give cyclists a safe route. Again, active travel must be a priority when planning infrastructure. Now, I did recently ask the Cabinet Secretary if there was any plans to build a cycle route in conjunction with the building of the Maybole Bypass on the A77, and apparently there is not. And I have to say, I think this is short-sighted and shows a lack of coordination between government departments. Surely, from a health perspective and a tourism perspective, looking at a cycle route with ambitions of joining Air and Stranraer is desirable. So the integration of active travel initiatives with other infrastructure projects, I think, has to be a sensible approach here. We have the financial barriers when statistics show us that households with higher household incomes have a greater access to bikes. That's why it's so important to increase provision of higher bikes or even free loan of bikes. A few weeks ago, I attended the launch of Brodie's Bikes Project at the University of the West of Scotland in Ayr. The project set up in memory of the UWS student Brodie Eaton, who passed away while studying at UWS, provides students living in halls of residence with access to bikes and safety equipment free of charge. So identifying all the reasons that limit people's ability to cycle and walk should be another priority. So delivering a sustainable long-term shift towards more active travel in Scotland is a complicated task within the even more complicated task of addressing Scotland's long-running issues with preventable illness, poor diet and an active lifestyle. There is a danger in formulating policy based on the need to hit headlines by meeting self-imposed targets rather than concentrating on bedding in cultural change for the long term. And the Scottish Government has an ambition of 10% journeys to be made by bike by 2020. Lots of good round headline worthy numbers, but there's little sign of progress towards this goal with only 2% of journeys being taken by bike in recent years. Presenting officer, the move towards an active travel nation won't happen overnight. It may well be that we achieve the long-term shift by focusing on today's school pupils and students who are still forming their travel habits, perhaps coupled with a long-term integrated infrastructure strategy. And in conclusion, we on the Conservative benches welcome the government's direction of travel, if you'll excuse the pun. However, the delivery on the, on the ground is what matters. So cross-portfolio working is what required here, uh, as was highlighted when questioning Minister Aileen Campbell last week during her announcement of the diet and obesity consultation. 
So far, the Minister has yet to demonstrate to me this kind of initiative and understanding of the issues and opportunities we have. So while we welcome it, jury's still out. Thank you. Can I just say to members that all these little extra 10 seconds add up and penalise someone towards the end of the debate. Uh, so can I call, please, um, Claudia Beamish to be followed. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong. Excuse me, Ms Beamish. Philip McGregor to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thanks, President Officer. Um, and it's a pleasure to be able to speak in this debate today. And I, I welcome the motion uh, put forward by the government and the £80 million pound investment and appointment of an active nation commissioner. I think, as others have said, um, repeating ground that others have said, but you know, walking or cycling to work as active travel is good for our health and the environment. And it's undeniable, as, as the Minister has said, that the, the impact walking and cycling can have on health, uh, both physical and mental. For example, the NHS states that regular walking alone has been shown to reduce the risk of chronic illnesses, including heart disease, type 2 diabetes, asthma, stroke, and some cancers. And we know that this is similar to the stats for cycling as well. And furthermore, it's been proven that walking improves in an individual's overall well-being and even helps fight depression. Research indicates that walking is, effect, is as effective as antidepressants in treating mild to moderate depression, and in some cases more effective, and as positive rather than negative side effects uh, into the bargain. Um, and while this is fantastic, well, of course, um, you know, I, I would put on record that antidepressant drugs are still a necessity in some instances. It is quite easy for us to incorporate walking more into our days, probably more so than cycling, as other speakers have mentioned. It does sometimes baffle me when we see the amount of cars parked outside primary schools in the morning due to parents taking their children to drop off. And I know, I know people are busy, and maybe everybody's uh, prone to that every now and again, but, you know, some people, um, it, it's, a, it's a very regular occurrence and, and part of the, the, the daily um, trip. And I'm sure I'm not the only um, MSP in the, the chamber here who has a mailbox is full of constituents complaining uh, about various parking scenarios over their constituencies. Um, for example, one of the, the ones that we're dealing with just now in terms of working with councillors as well is the, is the issue at the Coatbridge College campus, um, where there is, you know, there's far too many cars uh, obviously parked there. And, and one of the things that we're encouraging the, the college and others to do is to look at ways they can encourage their students and employees to, to use the, the walking routes that are available. And I think there is that on its own organisations to promote walking uh, as an alternative uh, to, to their work as well. Um, that, that said, it's, you know, it's, all, it's all very well saying that everybody should walk and cycle, but we really need to change it culturally. And I think everybody across all parties have said that. The Daily Mile is a really good example of this. I've spoken uh, debates in here before on the Daily Mile, and I know that most schools across my constituency uh, are engaging with it. I've spoke for the, for the last debate I spoke to. Um, some young people about it and they seem to really enjoy it and hopefully that, that embeds them in that culture of, of walking. Um, there are a couple of other groups in my constituency I'd like to uh, quickly mention. Um, the Muirhead District Pensioners Club who have started a walking club um, and they, they, they make that available to all um, members of their, of their community uh, and it's, it's going very successful. They won an award for that. Also the St Monica's Ramblers in Coatbridge uh, formed 25 years ago, they uh, dedicated themselves to organising walks every fortnight, getting people active across Lanarkshire, and they do everything from walking uh, country parks to scaling Monroe's. They beat the street, um, which was uh, operated across North Lanarkshire, my own office and myself signed up for it, and in total there was 104,000 miles completed, obviously not just by myself in the office, but across the whole of North Lanarkshire. Uh, and jog Scotland uh, in the Christon area as well, encouraging people to go out and, and jog um, a couple of times a week and, and, and get fresh air. And, and I think that although those examples that I've gave to, to mention organisations and projects in my constituency are not, um, you know, they're not directly equating to walking as, as active travel, they do still promote it through, through their endeavours, through what they're doing, and the, the, the leaders in these programmes uh, talking to the, the people who participate. And uh, I, I probably a good example of, of a, a sort of middle ground between that was the, uh, the, the new College Lanarkshire students when they created the Dunbeth Park Walk This Way route that I'd done a members debate on um, last year. And that was to encourage, amongst other things, uh, students to use the route at the lunchtime, but also uh, to, for students and employees to use the route on their way to the college or other work nearby. Um, I, do, I do want to pick up very quickly, it's come to the end, um, 
something Neil Bibby and Mike Rumbles mentioned, just about cycling and the affordability of cycling. I'm currently um, teaching my, my wee boy who's three and a half to ride his bike and you know, I, I'm lucky in that I, I can afford to, to do that, get my bike and there's a, the, we're able to travel to um, the locks and Cope Bridge and uh, use that for him to practice on and I do um, wonder about other people that's maybe not in that position so we maybe need to look at projects um, that, that can encourage that so that uh, young people have the opportunity to look at walking and cycling uh, as, as they go forward. There is a balance ability project in North Lanarkshire which uh, teaches children to cycle and I, I will stop there but um, I think I've made my point. Thanks very much. Cheers. Call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Marie Todd. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a really important debate and as co-convener of the cross-party group for cycling, walking and buses, I take a keen interest in active travel and its integration with public transport not to forget the rail cross-party group as well. I welcome the recognition in the Scottish Government motion of the collective effort which has gone into pushing forward uh, active travel. And on these benches, we also welcome the Scottish Government announcement of doubling the active travel budget. However, we must all acknowledge that Scotland is still far from the target of 10% uh, uh, of, uh, of um, journeys by bike by 2020. I'm very supportive of our Scottish Labour amendment today as it recognises the issue of transport poverty and calls specifically for action on this. It is indeed fantastic to see the Community Links Plus award flourishing since Alison Johnson and Jim Eady and myself as fellow co-conveners of the cross-party group on cycling in the last parliament proposed it to the Scottish Government. Uh, developments are, of the first winning project Glasgow City Council's South City Way are indeed underway. Floating bus stops, and, which I look forward to seeing, and uh, cycle uh, parking racks outside the community centres have been the first steps in developing opportunities for healthier and greener travel on a major uh, commuter belt. And this year's five winning entries in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Stirling and Inverness will be invaluable models for placemaking. However, in terms of transport poverty, uh, the award going forward must have inclusive criteria and so must the action on developing the new funding if this is to reach to more deprived communities. This summer I visited Amsterdam specifically to experience um, the, the difference in the cycling culture for myself. And being um, uh, in, in older cities is indeed <coughs> no excuse for not going forward. Here, many local authorities and community groups are proactively involving residents in the way forward. And the spokes event to be held jointly with Midlothian, East and West Lothian and Edinburgh City Council reps on the 9th of November is a good example of this, and here's the flyer to give it a plug. Um, of course, it is not only about road layout and placemaking that makes cyclists and pedestrians become equal road users. There are a wide range of ways in which we can become empowered and feel it is safe to take up active travel. One of these is through the protection of civil law, and we are one of the few countries in Europe which still does not have some form of strict or presumed liability to protect vulnerable road users. And I am personally a keen supporter of presumed liability, and there are those across all parties and far beyond who agree. I am clear that the time has come to acknowledge its value and to consider uh, acting further on this. Education for all road users is, of course, essential as we go forward. As an ex-primary teacher, I'm always been uncomfortable with how little there is in terms of on-road cycling education as par part of bikeability. I'm delighted to see that the figures have radically improved recently to 42%. I'm also delighted that walking is now part of the remit of our cross-party group along with cycling and buses. I've been asking myself and I ask everyone involved today in the chamber and beyond, does walking really have as much exposure as, as cycling in the active travel quest? And in terms of social justice and transport poverty, we hear Rambler's Scotland's briefing of a new study which demonstrated, I quote, that people living in the most deprived areas are more likely to take journeys by active travel and predominantly by walking. So this can be helped by pedestrianisation of streets, maintenance of pavements and paths, and making planning decisions which do put pedestrians first. We must not forget rural active travel either. There are still significant gaps in the national walking and cycling network. One such is in my region. The Crawford Community Council are keen to create opportunities for villagers themselves and to develop cycling and walking opportunities for tourist links. And this would help with local accommodation um, businesses. However, 
there are integrated transport link problems and enabling tourists to use trains and buses with their bikes uh, must happen more actively. It is now several years since I asked Keith Brown when he was the transport minister to consider the model of the hook-on carriages, which I understand in one of our briefings is highlighted, um, that is very successful in the, in the South Tyrol, where large dedicated uh, carriages are used. Will the minister explore this further? And finally, in terms of transport poverty again, uh, this morning, our Eclair committee took evidence on air quality affecting our community's health and the development of active travel will be key in this. So in the words of the five uh, third sector organisations which put a joint briefing together, heartening in itself, achieving active travel uh, nation vision and growth in walking and cycling will only be delivered through collaboration th uh, between, bus sorry, between business, transport, health, and planning, economic uh, And you must conclude, I'm very sorry. You sectors. must conclude. Uh, I call Marie together. Todd to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to draw members' attention to my register of interest, interest because I'm a trustee for the Peffery Way Association. Our goal is to create an off-road path suitable for walkers, wheelchairs, buggies and bikes, which links Dingwall and Strathpeffer and all of the communities in between. So, like many in this chamber and all over Scotland, I very much welcome the commitment the programme for government to double active, funding, um, active travel funding for walking and cycling to 80 million a year. With reference to the Green Amendment, I think this is the rapid shift in resources required to hit the 10% target for making everyday journeys by bike. We might not be matching the level of funding and leading... Yep. John Finney. Thank you. I'm very grateful for the member taking intervention on that point. Does the member have, uh, the, share the concerns I have about the lack of maintenance that's taken place on many roads and bridges across the country as a result of the expenditure on two main roads in particular? Marie Todd. Thank you. I have had some concerns with that and I have actually raised those with uh, both Sustrans and I am raising them with Bear Scotland as well. We may not be matching the level of funding in leading European countries, but we are way ahead of the other nations in the UK. A whopping annual £13.50 per head here compared to £6.50 in England outside London and only £3 to £5 pounds per head in Wales. In Northern Ireland, the Department for Infrastructure has previously acknowledged that the funding available for cycling has been limited and spread thinly. We are doing a great thing in Scotland. The benefits of walking and cycling are extremely well researched and documented. Cycling and walking for sm short journeys in local communities can help provide an answer to pressing issues faced in Scotland, including air pollution, town and city congestion, ill health, obesity, and the rising cost of physical inactivity to the NHS. Walking and cycling are also um, a cost-effective method of transport for short journeys and can be an enjoyable and fun way of travelling if the environment is safe and accessible. The physical benefits are obvious, but the benefits to mental health are also huge, with evidence of reducing stress, depression and even dementia. Whilst nearly everyone walks, at least some of the time, only about 1% of trips are by bike, as others have said, and this government wants to see that rise to 10%. Now, the big barrier to cycling is safety. If we want to get more than just the dedicated few lycra-clad men cycling, we need to do more than paint a line on the road. We need to build dedicated infrastructure which segregates cyclists from traffic. Data from Denmark shows that only 30% of cyclists feel safe mixing with traffic, but 70% feel safe on segregated paths. That is why everyone is so excited about this extra money, because it will undoubtedly deliver new infrastructure and that will increase active travel. Another great statistic from Denmark shows that new cycle paths typically generate a 20% increase in cyclists from day one. If you build it, they will come, you might say. An example of this in my own region is the Three Distilleries Pathway in Isla. It's a brand new path running from Port Ellen and taken in the distilleries of Lafroy, Glagvullen and Ardbeg. The path runs for five and a half kilometres and is fully accessible for walkers, cyclists, pushchairs and wheelchairs. The idea behind it was to link, was to enable visitors to go to the distilleries and sample the goods without drinking and driving. But now there are loads of locals using it too. In Inverness, 
thanks to the high-profile cycle route developments like the Milburn Road Shared Use Path and the Golden Bridge, the number of cycle communities, commuters has more than doubled in the last few years. So we're up to 8% in Inverness. Earlier this year, I was delighted to see Inverness receive funding to develop cycle-friendly infrastructure as part of the Sustrans Community Links Plus Design Competition, as Claudia Beamish mentioned. Inverness is a growing city, and I think that building cycling into the transport system could fundamentally change the way we live in future, and I welcome that. I want to finish by mentioning some of the economic benefits I expect from this investment. Scotland is, of course, a fantastic destination for cycle tourism. And the Highlands and Islands, the region I represent, we boast some of the most scenic cycle routes in the country. Cycle tourism brings great benefits and great value to the Scottish economy. According to Sustrans, it was worth 345 million in 2015. There are some brilliant long distance routes in the National Cycle Network already, and plans to link destinations like Skye and Ollipol to Inverness are really welcome and will integrate the incredibly successful Hebridean Way with mainland links. I think that's a fantastic plan. And that's a nice place it. to stop. Thank you very much. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Bruce Cofford. Mr Kerr, please. Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, any moves by parties and communities to encourage active travel, particularly in relation to cycling, must be welcomed. And it is in that spirit that I focus my comments. Firstly, the Scottish Government set out, as we've heard, in the 2010 Cycling Action Plan, an objective to achieve a 10% modal share by 2020. However, the 2016 Transport and Travel in Scotland document showed a decrease in cycling as the main mode of travel to work from 2.6% in 2014 to 2.2% in 2015. Now, national statistics show that commuters have switched back to the car from cycling, with 8% of those who cycled to work a year ago now driving. And nearly one-fifth say this is due to too many cars on the road. And I think that's what we need to focus on. Because I note in passing that at the moment the answer seems to be an arbitrary 20 mile per hour speed limit that is observed by virtually no one, is all but unenforceable, mirrors a scheme that Manchester has just abandoned, apparently due to minimal impact on speed or accidents, increases emissions, and does nothing to make cycling a better commute. Now, in that regard, I want to develop a point that Mike Rumbles made. I cycle to Parliament, and I've been road cycling for about 30 years now. Now, I've been knocked off my bike on Parliament Square by a bus, on Tottenham Court Road by a car, and I've collided with a lamppost when a tourist stepped in front of me on the King's Road. But I would still rather ride in London than try to negotiate my current route from the McDonald Road Leith Walk Junction down the London Road and trying to take that right at Abbey Lane as two opposing lines of traffic vie to see how closely they can get their wing mirrors to me. Now, the Scottish Conservatives document Global Challenge Local Leadership calls for one segregated cycle route in each of Scotland's cities and safe travel routes to schools. And Marie Todd is right. We will never encourage significant numbers of people to cycle to work or school if they have been asked to cycle only on unsegregated roads. According to the Sustrans Cycling Scotland, etc. report, 42% of primary schools provide on-road cycle training. But this is a wasted resource if parents don't feel comfortable letting their kids ride. Now, John Finney makes some positive remarks on school cycling, but if we really want people to cycle, we've got to make it safe and comfortable for them to do so. And that means all abilities, including children and those less confident, as the Liberal Democrat Amendment rightly calls for. So I wonder if the minister can expand in closing on the extent to which cycling can be designed into roads and junctions. Now, secondly, members may recall that in May of this year, I called a debate on bike capacity on trains. Currently, nearly all long-distance ScotRail trains are Class 170 Turbostars, with four official bike spaces on board. From summer 2018, ScotRail will introduce what we'll colloquially call Intercity 125s. Now, despite ScotRail's 2015 promise that, quote, the 125s will have a capacity of at least 20 cycles, in the Minister's opening remarks, he conceded there would only be eight spaces. Now, following my debate and a great deal of pressure from, amongst others, the spokes organisation, Transport Scotland recently reached an agreement with ScotRail to increase the number of spaces available at intermediate stations from two to four. With six in the power cars, that is 10 spaces in all, which is a long way short of at least 20. 
And although increasing the intermediate capacity to four merely takes us back to the existing class 170 capacity, in practice it will be worse. Because on a 170, three bikes can squeeze into two cycle spaces. But you lose that flexibility on the high-speed trains as the storage is on hanging hooks, which themselves are a challenge for those of lesser stature or lesser strength. So this is not good news for Aviemore, Montrose or Stonehaven, which are great jumping off points for cycle tourism. Now, finally, in the opening remarks, the minister mentioned the programme for government. And on page 59, it is stated that, quote, dedicated carriages for cycles and outdoor sports equipment on rural routes in the north and west, end quote, will be introduced. Now, if this actually means what it implies, an additional coach on these routes, then this is positive. But we have no details yet. What is the north and west? Does it include the northeast? Where is the rolling stock coming from? Which services in particular are we talking about? What does success look like in terms of usage? Now, in September, I asked the Scottish Government these questions and more, but I haven't yet had an answer. I've no doubt it'll come soon. But in closing, spokes say in their latest newsletter that if the reports of the extra carriage are true, quote, then all concerned, and especially Minister Hamza Youssef, will be heroes. Minister, this is the moment. In the, you are my hero, Hamza. In the government's closing, be the hero. I'm Answer afraid on that note, uh, declaring yourself, all waiting for. declaring that Mr Hamza Youssef is your hero, then we will move on. Live that down, Mr Kerr. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Colin Smith. Mr Crawford. President Officer, from Superman to reality. On Friday last week, I was delighted to join people from Stirling Cycle Hub together with the Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown and others to celebrate the third anniversary of the Stirling City's fabulous rental bike scheme, Nextbike. Nextbike has been delivered through Fourth Environment Link, has seen 37,000 cycle journeys since it started, with over 24,000 in the past year alone. It's a truly remarkable success story in my constituency and one that I'm delighted that Transport Scotland is sent to build on. The Cabinet Secretary announced an, a further £270,000 of investment into Stirling's Cycle Hub's Next Bike Scheme. That's an awful mouthful. Bringing the overall Scottish Government investment into the organisation to over £1 million. And I understand further funding will secure five smart screens across Forth Valley that provides advice to the public about walking and cycle routes, as well as tight tips on bike maintenance, but perhaps more importantly, President Officer, it will bring a fleet of e-bikes that's available to rent by members of the public to 50. President Officer, this is the first ever large-scale electric bike scheme of its kind in Scotland, a remarkable achievement by those involved in piecing it together. I understand that today there are over 2,000 registered and active users of the scheme. This number includes many who've opted to leave the car at home so they can engage in this exciting and accessible mode of active travel. Stirling Cycle Hub aim is clear, to turn Stirling into a cycling city where cycling is made appealing, accessible and rewarding. The development and growth of this service among those who live in Stirling area is in large part due to the support from Transport Scotland, Sustrans and Stirling Council. This project has made a great advancement in improving the cycling culture in Stirling and the numbers speak for themselves. Since opening up to the public in 2014, the service has seen a 300% increase in usage, clearly signalling a shift in local attitudes to Stirling. And, President Officer, Stirling Council has also recently been awarded £2.7 million from Community Links Plus to create a world-class active travel network in our city. President Officer, I may have mentioned a couple of times in the past in these debates that I re represent what I consider to be one of the most beautiful and inspiring constituencies in our country. And that includes the vast rural setting of the lochs, the mountains and the highland glens, a perfect destination in which to enjoy outdoor life on foot or bike. And I was privileged to take part in the opening of the Strathire to Kingshouse pathway and cycle track in rural Stirling. And this project saw investment from the Scottish Government, which was matched funded by Stirling Council and Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. A 3.5 kilometre route allowing residents to cycle or walk on a traffic-free track between the communities that also gives access 
to other existing routes in the area. Saying officer, the Loch Lomond and Trasix National Park have also worked with Transport Scotland and Sustrans across my constituency to create many more opportunities for actual travel. And through this partnership approach and an uplift in active travel funding in recent years, 20 kilometres of projects have been delivered in places such as Drimmon, Tyndrum, Strathire, Callander, Croftami and St. St. Philans, with a total capital value of £3.5 million. Now, while well, I'm on matters to do with the rural aspect, Fiona, Rosanna Cunningham would never forgive me if I didn't mention the Three Saints Way. That route itself can already be walked in part. However, once it gets completed, it will connect Killin on the most western edge of my constituency to St Andrews on the most northern eastern coast of Fife. Some of that expansion into walking to compare with the North Route 500 that others talked about earlier. Now, the things I've demonstrated today, President Officer, say to me this is governmental action representing real improvement despite the curmudgeonly tone we've taken by some of the during the debate today. In 2011-12, the active travel budget was 17.5 million. In 18-19, it will be 80 million. Let's celebrate this and other real achievements that are being made on the ground. I just wish I'd had time to address some of the real issues that Labour have raised in their transport poverty and their amendment. And I welcome that amendment and the way they've brought that forward and the tone they brought it forward in, because they've also got to make real progress there. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Crawford. I call Colin Smith, be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. As Labour's spokesperson on public health and a member of the Health and Sport Committee, I want to focus my brief comments on the important health benefits of active travel. And those benefits, President Officer, are significant. I'm pleased that the Minister highlighted the fact that, that being active can have a, a positive impact on our mental health and well-being. It can also reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, of stroke, of a heart attack, cancers such as bowel cancer and also dementia. Walking and cycling are also the ultimate low emission options for local transport, reducing air pollution, the cause of thousands of premature deaths every year. Yet despite these benefits, only about two thirds of adults in Scotland currently meet the moderate to vigorous physical activity guidelines, and a quarter describe their activity levels as low or very low. That's why increasing active travel is so important. And with two thirds of journeys under three kilometres being done by car in Scotland, there's no doubt there is scope to deliver that increase in active travel if we break down the barriers to walking and cycling. One of those barriers is unquestionably the activity gap that exists in Scotland, with physical activity levels in more prosperous areas higher than levels in our most deprived communities. Communities that, as we've heard from Neil Bibby and Claudia Beamish, already suffer high levels of transport poverty. The recent Scottish Household Survey found that there was a 18-point gap between the percentage of adults participating in physical activity from sports to walking between the richest and the poorest communities. 69% of people from the poorest backgrounds have taken part in some form of physical or sporting activity, compared to 87% from the most affluent. The survey found that you were three times more likely to go cycling if you live in the most affluent areas. But the activity gap was especially large when it came to walking, with 77% of people in more affluent areas likely to go for a 30-minute walk compared to 57% in our most deprived communities. So if we want to increase walking and cycling for travel or recreational purposes, there needs to be a particular focus on breaking down the barriers to activity within some of our most deprived communities, starting by actually routinely measuring participation rates within those communities, something that isn't currently done. But it's not just among the least well-off groups that barriers to cycling and walking exist. Roger Geffen, the policy director of Cycling UK, said that UK cycling conditions, to quote, disproportionately deter young people older people, women and people with disabilities from cycling. Issues such as safety and accessibility must be tackled both in cycling and walking if we are to prevent these groups of people being excluded. As we've already heard, that will take investment. Studies from across the world show that barriers to walking and cycling are broken down and cultural shifts towards active travel take place if we invest in the necessary infrastructure. The drastic expansion of segregated cycleways in Seville saw the proportion of journeys made by bike increase from 0.5% to 6%. Research from Denmark found that new cycle tracks increased bicycle traffic by 20% from day one. Yet the cuts to local councils who need to match fund active travel projects in Scotland to secure such strand support means the rollout of cycleways has been far slower here. 
If we are serious about achieving a step change in active travel, we need to be serious about ending the cuts to local council budgets. We also need to empower local communities to deliver bold and creative solutions, increase cycling and walking. And I want to briefly highlight one example that Fulton McGregor referred to earlier. When I chaired Dumfries and Galloway Council's Economy, Environment and Infrastructure Committee, I had the privilege of being involved in a, a fantastic initiative called Beat the Street, which prompted a significant increase in cycling and walking in towns across the region. For members unfamiliar with the, the scheme, it operates as a game. Participants collect points in a card or a fob by walking, cycling or running across the town, swiping their card or fob when they reach scanners usually attached to lampposts. Points are counted on a leaderboard and there are cash prizes available for the winning teams, often representing local community groups. It is an inclusive and community-focused initiative targeted at those of all ages and all levels of fitness, and the levels of, of participation were exceptional. In 2016, Beat the Street came to Stranraer, and nearly 4,000 residents, that's 39% of the population, took part. And of those, 80% said they continued the changes they made during this time. The proportion of adults reporting frequent active travel increased from 57% before Beat the Street to 62% six months later. And the number reporting no active travel decreased from 16% to just 2%. The figures were similar in other towns, over 1,625 in Dobiti, that's a third of the population, and Annan, 3,285 players took part, nearly 40% of the population, the highest percentage that have played anywhere in the world. In the past few months, the scheme was rolled out in my hometown of Dumfries, where nearly 8,000 people played, signed up as part of 83 teams. It's a clear example, presiding officer, of the benefits of creative and locally led interventions, and it's one that I very much wholeheartedly commend and hope that it will be rolled out across other communities as a result Thank of the you. increase in active travel. Thank funding. you very much, Thank Stuart you. Stevenson, followed by Finlay Carson. Mr. Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, just as uh, the last time I spoke in a debate on active travel, I want to focus on walking. Um, in the uh, motions and the amendments before us, there are only two references to walking. There are nine references to cycling. And yet, uh, the accessibility of walking is substantially greater than the accessibility of cycling. And I want to suggest to colleagues here that the best way of improving active uh, travel is to encourage people to walk. So let's uh, have a wee think about some numbers. Um, looking at uh, the report on prescriptions uh, in uh, the last year, for which I've been able to find numbers, uh, of the top five prescriptions, prescription number one, number three, and number five, total 8.78 million prescriptions. Those are all uh, for respiratory conditions, particular conditions that are uh, conditions that will be greatly benefited by people taking more exercise, quite gentle exercise, or if they're capable of it, uh, more uh, serious exercise. Now, how much does those prescriptions cost? Well, I don't actually quite know, but the average cost of prescription is £10. So we're looking, but these are the top end, so they're actually more expensive than that. So we're looking at a figure that is in excess, just for those three prescriptions, of the active travel budget. Now, what is the cost of a pair of trainers? A decent pair of trainers, not a classy pair of trainers, you can get for about 30 quid. 30 quid, a pair of thick socks and a pair of thin socks, and you're ready to go. So let's get our doctors uh, in a position where they prescribe walking and the equipment with which it can be done to improve the health of the nation and promote uh, active travel. Now, I have a few words to say uh, to colleagues in the Scottish uh, parliamentary corporate body, because it's not just the government can do things. Uh, paragraph 11.18 uh, in the, uh, in the uh, allowances scheme for Parliament. You're required, if you take a taxi costing more than £20, to provide a letter of justification. Well, let me suggest that we add to that that you're required to provide a letter of justification if the taxi journey did not exceed one mile, because it's the short taxi journeys that we should be replacing. From the outset, we've been paying members here 45 pence a mile if they use their car, but only 20 pence if they use their cycle. How about turning that round so that we pay them 45 pence if they use their cycle and 20 pence if they use their car? Now, I know this sounds a little bit whimsical, 
But the reality is, we're actually going to have to... Yes, I will, Mr Finney, if you're brief. John Finney. Yes, I, I will be very brief. Would you like to explain to me how I can cover an area between the north of Shetland and the of Kintyre on a push bike with a dearth of public transport, much as I would like to? He's only got a minute and a half to do that. The bottom line is we've got to challenge the existing norms and have a debate around it. It's not meant to be there, because I too have a similar problem, albeit on a, a, a smaller scale. Um, now, I'm, I'm glad that I now have as my greatest fan here uh, Mr. Rumbles, who mentioned me three times uh, in the first minute of his contribution uh, in 2007, uh, 2009, I said it would be challenging to reach a 20% target for cycling. Well, I got that one right, I think it's fair to say, colleagues. But we can be ambitious, uh, genuinely ambitious in walking. I've done four kilometres today. That's 5,650 steps. I prefer to count kilometres, it sounds bigger than miles, um, and the rest of us should also be doing something at least uh, uh, as, as big as that. Liam Kerr tells us he, he cycles. That's good. My last bicycle cost me a fiver. I'm not going to pay more than 25 for my next one when I go to a rural route. I will be able to get that. Now, let me just uh, conclude, uh, presiding officer, in the remaining very, very few seconds uh, by saying that we all have at our own feet the tools to promote this agenda. We should, as MSPs, be seen to be walking. We should encourage others to walk. It delivers health, wealth, and a community benefit. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. I call Finlay Carson, to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr. Carson, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate on the promotion of walking and cycling as active travel in Scotland particularly as someone who regularly cycles to work and for pleasure. And it's vitally important that we acknowledge the correlation between active travel and the protection of the Scottish environment when we discuss today's issues. However, it's clear from the past seven years that the SNP government has failed to adequately engage with the population to encourage a satisfactory level of active travel across Scotland. With almost no progress to show from the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework, the only track the government is currently peddling on is one that will lead them from missing their own targets. Active travel plays a crucial role in the reduction of air pollution, which in many areas is exacerbated by people travelling by car on short commutes to work. In 2017 alone, the number of sites where air pollution levels are regularly broken rose from 33 in 2016 to 38 in 2017, according to Friends of the Earth. And we know that there's an estimated 2,500 deaths attributed to air pollution. I, I, sorry, I don't have time. By making realistic commitments properly funded and supported, the government can reduce air pollution and increase healthy outcomes by encouraging and facilitating a greater uptake of cycling in our towns and cities. A commitment to further investing in ch children's cycling proficiency training alongside further designated cycle routes across the country will provide an additional catalyst for greater active travelling, bring, bringing us closer to the, achieving the modal shift we need to come even close to achieving the ambitious targets of 10% of all journeys to be made by bike by 2020. The Scottish Government has substantially increased the active transport budget, but it still remains less than 4% of the overall transport budget. I welcome the Government's Cycling Action Plan established to provide funding for communities, local authorities and other relevant bodies to work towards this 10% of all adult cycling to work. But it's going to be a difficult task. In 2014, the figure was 2.6%, dropping to 2.2% in 2016, according to stats from the Transport Scotland. With the current disappointing 0.2 increase in everyday bike journeys in the past decade, without concerted effort, it will take a further 300 years for the Scottish Government to reach the 10% mark. It's a very admirable uh, target, but this can, can this Government really achieve it? The Scottish Government needs to invest wisely. As mentioned by Claudia Beamish, there should be no excuses made for old street layouts, etc. If Copenhagen and Amsterdam, Amsterdam can integrate active travel so successfully, then so should we. We need more modal shift, we need to change attitudes and remove barriers to people taking their bikes or their feet to work. 
Even simple things like accelerated rollout of more bike stands would remove the barrier created by people having to carry bikes up flights of stairs. One of my own experiences, and I can tell you electric mountain bikes are way too heavy to carry up any stairs. We should look at successful active transport schemes across the world and indeed closer to home. The UK government is providing £1 billion worth of funding to local bodies in England through its cycling and walking investment strategy. And as a result, it has seen an increase in cycling rates where it has increased dedicated funding. The Scottish government should look at the successes south of the border and learn lessons and improve on the progress made uh, to, with our neighbours. We in these benches understand the benefits encouraging active travel in Scotland. Through the global challenge, leader, uh, local leadership, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Environment and Climate Change Position Paper, we are committed to working with local authorities and third party partners to improve our cycle path network. Furthermore, we're committed to supporting safe travel routes to school in order to encourage active travel from a young age. Whilst currently it appears that the Scottish Government is peddling an unrealistic target akin to a bike riding without a chain, a properly targeted and funded budget could and hopefully will provide for greater success in promoting active travel and the benefits that come with such action. My colleagues and I on these benches will support that aim. Thank you. I call Emma Harper and Ms Harper will be the last speaker in the open debate. Then we move to closing speeches. Ms Harper. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to speak today about the importance of walking and cycling and I've decimated my speech knowing that the time isn't going to be too long. So, um, Ms Harper, you can have your five minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, as a member of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, I'm well aware of the public health benefits promoting active travel will bring and I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to doubling the active travel budget uh, from 2018 a commitment that has been hailed by Cycling UK's Chief Executive as an unprecedented level of investment into active travel from a national government. As an MSP with a healthcare background, I understand that active travel is so important from a public health perspective because the best way to achieve the health enhancing potential of physical activity is for people to incorporate that activity into their daily lives. By replacing time spent commuting by car with physically active forms of travel such as walking and cycling, physical activity becomes embedded in participants' daily routines. It is therefore welcome news that both cycling and walking and scooting continue to increase steadily every year as the main mode of getting to work. The doubling of the active travel budget will allow major capital infrastructure projects to be funded in both urban and rural settings. However, it is important to recognise that active travel faces different challenges in rural and urban areas. Experience in Dumfries and Galloway shows that for it to be successful, active travel must be relevant, relevant to people's lives and appropriately executed. It is hard in rural areas to use cycling or walking as a means to get into work. If I had to cycle to work, it would be a 150 mile round trip from Dumfries to Stranraer or Ayrshire for meetings or surgeries. Recently, my colleague Daniel Johnston, MSP, uh, he was discussing with me how he gets to work and he says he lives five minutes from his office and he walks. That would be quite a challenge for many of us MSPs in rural areas. I am making an effort to walk to the office from home as much as possible and walk to Parliament while in Edinburgh to support my active travel. In Dumfries and Galloway, walking and cycling is a as a leisure is very popular already and it's well established. We already have over 450 miles of signposted cycle routes as well as many off-road cycle trails and world-class mountain bike trail centres. With our network of picturesque roads, road cycling, it has massive potential. And I'm pleased to say that Dumfries and Galloway is one of the local authority areas with an active travel strategy in place. We are lucky to have a well-developed and accessible path network which encourages walking and cycling as daily activities, but there is still potential for more improvement. To realise this potential, the right infrastructure needs to be in place to provide user-friendly, signposted and safe links for residents and visit visitors. Earlier this year, I attended a great event in Parliament sponsored by my colleague Angus Macdonald, MSP and it was hosted by an organisation called Cycling Without Age. During the evening, I learned about this new initiative to get older people out into the fresh air. 
It's a great scheme which has health benefits for both pilots and passengers of the trike shows. A similar scheme has been started in Falkirk and I have been uh, linking with local stakeholders to um, explore the potential of a similar scheme in Dumfries and Galloway. Investing in safe cycling infrastructure will be vital to ensure the success of such schemes. So when the programme for government was announced, I wrote to Transport Minister to explore ideas for investment in the South West. I am particularly interested in the government's plans for a long distance walking and cycling route equivalent to the NC 500 or the North Coast 500. And I have written to government to recommend, including the coast of the southwest of Scotland, maybe Fitroon to Gretna, as well as inland, which would be a particularly fantastic place. Absolutely, yes. Just one of the, the members. Hang on a minute, Mr. Carson, get my button pressed. <laughs> Finlay Carson. Thank you, President <laughs> Officer. Does, it, does, does the member recognise the, the southwest 300 already established uh, route that's uh, already in a lot of the tourist information? Emma Harper, you've got 30 seconds. Absolutely. I recognise that the South West 300 has been established, but it's primarily been identified for cars. I'm talking about walking and cycling here. We're talking about a coastal development that would encourage tourism in the South West of Scotland. So, presiding officer, I look forward to working with the Scottish Government to develop significant infrastructure which will be so much welcomed in the south of Scotland that reflects the social value of active travel and promote more walking and cycling for the people who I represent. Thank you. I move to closing speeches. I call Mike Rumbles. Those of the Liberal Democrats, Mr Rumbles. This has been a largely a very consensual debate because we all want to see the Government succeed in its aim of increasing the number of journeys taken by walking and cycling. If I can just mention two contributions which, which took my eye. Gillian Martins said that living in Edinburgh three days a week, she can now walk to work. And I agree entirely. I normally bus and walk two miles a day to and from work, and I feel the benefit of this, and I think we could all feel the benefit of it by doing so. Liam Kerr made some excellent points about the availability or not of bike spaces on our rail network and finished by saying that if the transport minister delivered these extra bike spaces as promised, he would be his hero. Well, I'd like to have the transport minister as a hero as well. I have to say, Deputy Presiding Officer, I said I'd like to have, I didn't say he was. I have to say, Deputy Presiding Officer, all parties are largely agreed on what should happen. However, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And if I may say so to the minister, he is in the driving seat on this one. Yes, he is delivering a doubling of the budget, and everyone has welcomed this. But will his own government's target be achieved? In the next three years, we're supposed to move from 1% or 2% of journeys by bike to 10%. I'm, everyone knows, and I'm mentioning Stuart Stevenson again, that this is not going to be achieved, even though Stuart perhaps thinks it's still going to be achieved. It's not going to be achieved without dramatic action. I'm not convinced that we're going to get that dramatic action that would be necessary. Minister, I would be delighted if you could prove me wrong on this one. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Liberal Democrats will be supporting the motion and all the amendments except the Green Amendment uh, because simply we are worried about the impact this might have on our public transport network. No one wants to put our public transport system at risk because of such a dramatic change in the budget. It's outcomes, it's outcomes, and I mentioned that, it's outcomes that the Liberal Democrats are, men, uh, are focused on, not necessarily inputs, which the Greens seem to be focused on. Deputy Presiding Officer, I've already moved the amendment in my name, and I'm pleased to finish early so that other people could speak. Thank you. And that's very gallant of you, Mr Rumbles. Can I call on Alison Johnson, opposed to the Liberal Democrats? Ms Johnson, please. I'm closing for the Greens, Presiding Officer. Um, as this debate has shown, when we discuss active I'm travel... I'm so sorry, did I call you a lib... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Twice! Twice yes. I've done that! Yes. I'll yes. give you an extra 30 seconds, Thanks. that's my penance. Thank you, officer. Thank you, it's quite traumatic. Um, as this debate has shown, when we discuss active travel, we discuss so many issues, from mental health to poverty. Um, I prefer to call it walking and cycling, but as my colleague John Finney has pointed out, some people do their active travel by kayak. 
But the contributions we've heard in this debate highlight how investment in walking and cycling can help us improve so many aspects of life in Scotland. And it's essential that these activities, which are the solutions to so many of the challenges we face, are invested in and properly. We know that the cost of heart disease and diabetes alone takes £40 million annually from the NHS. But this is just under half of the amount that physical inactivity is costing us. And the Health and Sport Committee, as we've heard, is undertaking its Sport for Everyone inquiry. And the testimonies we've received make it clear that time and cost are two of the biggest barriers to becoming physically active. And this is where walking and cycling are really important. When they're safe and attractive options, they save people time and money. And exercise, as we've heard from colleagues, becomes part of their daily routine. We might chuckle when we hear of folk driving to the gym to sit on a stationary bike for half an hour, but that's not an option for everyone. Some people can't afford that gym membership, and 50% of people in Glasgow, for example, don't have access to a car. So let's do what we can to make you know, physical activity possible for everyone. So many car journeys in Scotland are short and could easily be undertaken by foot or bike. 30% of them are between one and two miles. 11% of journeys taken by car are under a mile. But as we've heard, currently the national percentage of journeys taken by bike, 1.2% in 2016. Um, I probably won't join in with calling Hamza Youssef my hero if he manages to increase that to 10% of all journeys by bike by 2020. But I will say that it will take heroic hard work to go from the 1.2% we're seeing now to 10% in three years. Transport Scotland officials have told the committee this morning that this is going to happen, and I really hope it does. I hope we're all congratulating the Minister on that in 2020. Do, things do have to change. We will support the Lib Dem amendment, but I'd point out that the bikeability training is still relying on volunteers. So we have to do more to make sure those volunteers are supported. And Claudia Beamish was right to point out that Presumed liability has an important role to play here. Wherever high levels of cycling have been achieved, presumed liability is part of civil law. Only the UK, Romania, Malta and Cyprus, I think, don't have such law. It really is time to look at this again. And when I debated this in members' business in 2013, there was cross-party support for that. Let's look at that again. Wholeheartedly support Pedal on Parliament's eight-point manifesto. There probably isn't anything in there that the Transport Minister could disagree with and I'm sure that's the same across the Chamber and I'm sure members will wish to join me in congratulating Spokes who celebrate their 40th anniversary this year. They are the Lothian Cycle Campaign but they've been involved in bringing so many policy issues to this Chamber and to this Parliament and I think they really have led the way on so many issues whether that's about being able to store your bike outside if you live in a tenement or building the strategic network of major motor traffic free cycle routes that we clearly need. That's our party policy. We're seeing some movement, but when it comes to initiatives like the Bears Way and the Edinburgh East to West route, we still see a lot of disagreement and dispute. Um, I took part in a uh, you know, a sort of a, a cycle to show support for the East v West route in Edinburgh. It is the only time in my life that I've had people shouting shame on you at me. And that was because they'd been convinced that business in that area would ground to halt. But we know from looking at international research that cycling in communities has a really positive impact on, on um, business. Footfall increases, neighbourhoods are safer and shops do really well indeed. And it's really important that we get that message out to people. Let's look at what's happening in this city at the moment. The Broughton Spurtle are speaking about what's, the, you know, the proposals for Picardy Place, five minutes walk from here. Uh, we're going to see a huge gyratory, very unpedestrian friendly, simply a challenge for cyclists. We can and must do better. It's no accident, presiding officer, that the Dutch, the WHO, the World Health Organization, are saying that the Dutch by 2030 are going to be the slimmest nation in Europe, that every other nation will be facing an, an obesity epidemic. And what do we see there? Movement and activity is just part and parcel of everyday life. Air pollution, the British Heart Foundation have shown us that air pollution can make existing heart conditions worse, that it's linked to increased risk of heart attack and stroke. 
This is an area that's just got win after win after win if we invest in it properly. Um, I'm sorry that the Conservatives and the SNP find our motion too radical, too ambitious. We will continue to call for that 10% of the transport budget spent on active travel because we need to do that. Thank and you. I gave you your 30 seconds. I hope you Thanks. noted. I hope I get this right. A call would a grant to close for Labour. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, it's been a good debate, and I think there is a lot of agreement across the Chamber that active travel must increase. And this has obvious benefits in improving air quality. It's good for the environment. It also improves our health, both physical and mental health. And it saves people a lot of money. And transport poverty was the subject of our amendment. Um, Neil Bibby spoke about transport poverty and pointed out how much, how, how most of the affluent areas have a higher bike ownership than those in the most um, deprived communities. And we ask ourselves why, because surely bike ownership is cheaper than um, buying a car and the like. And it, I, I believe it's down to the infrastructure in our deprived areas. And there's also affordability of, of bikes and the like. And we can see that good bikes cost a huge amount of money. But there are good schemes out there that recycle bikes and provide them affordably to people. So that maybe overcome one of the obstacles. But what about uh, looking after your bike, somewhere to store it in those communities um, and the, the cost of upkeep? Fulton McGregor talked about um, the cost of children's bikes and it's important, I think, that children learn to cycle young. Now, that's a skill that will stay with them, but they need to learn while they're not afraid of balancing on a bike and the like. So there's the cost of a ch child's bike and there's also access to a safe area to learn. Um, and that all costs money and Claudia Beamish talked about how we spend this additional money the government has given. And maybe this is an area for priority for the, for the new spending. Working in more deprived areas, encouraging young people to learn, giving children access to bikes and safe places um, to learn to cycle as well. Gillian Martin and Brian Whittle talked about children's active travel to school, both walking and cycling, and indeed talked about the fear um, that some parents have about the safety of their children. And I think safety is an issue that has kind of popped up throughout the debate. Nobody has to totally focused on it, but it is an issue that has, has been touched on. And there is conflict. There's conflict between pedestrians, between cyclists, and between cars. And the minister did say in his opening that uh, there was going to be road user training as part of that expenditure. Um, and John Finney talked about courtesy between different road users. But there can be um, conflict between pedestrians and cyclists, especially because we now have m many more shared paths. Um, and those are quite often signposted. But the areas that aren't shared paths are not signposted so that pedestrians um, b become in, put in dangerous um, conditions. And a, a constituent of mine wrote to me ahead of this debate and asked me to point out one incident that he'd seen where there's a community cafe that opens up onto the pavement. The pavement is not a shared route for cyclists and pedestrians. And he said that some of the elderly users of the cafe are in danger, and indeed one was knocked down and hurt uh, just leaving the cafe. And they have now put up signs to say to pedestrians to be careful that people are cyclists are using that pavement. So we need better signposting, not just for the areas that are shared a cycle and pedestrian routes, but we have to make it very clear to cyclists where it's not appropriate for them to cycle. And that was pointed out to Inverness councillors who were um, who experienced what it was like to be deaf blind and walk down the street because they can't hear a bike and they can't hear a bell. And the same thing for people who roller blade and cycle as well. I actually almost saw an accident. Luckily, both managed to stop in time between someone cycling and someone roller blading. So we need to teach all road users how to, to use the road safely for everybody. The debate talked a lot about cycling, but we also need to talk about walking as just as important because it's, it's free to do, it's, it's easy to do, and it has the same health benefits. And Colin Smith talked about the health benefits that we could all accrue. 
presiding officer, we need to win over hearts and minds to increase active travel. And the minds of planners and transport strategists and the like, they need to make it safe and attractive. And only that way can we win over the hearts of those who would be encouraged into active travel. Thank you very much. And I call Donald Cameron to close with the Conservatives. Mr Cameron, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the government for providing the opportunity to discuss this issue, uh, particularly in the light of the uh, cons consultation on diet and obesity, which was announced last week. Because, of course, active travel has a potential to mitigate some of the most damaging and burdensome aspects of Scotland's obesity problem. And having spoken about this on numerable occasions since I was elected last year, from a health perspective, I'm acutely aware that we need to act rather than simply talk and, and strategize. Encouraging more people to walk and cycle, whether they commute or simply for personal pleasure, will also help cut carbon emissions, deliver more pleasant communities and support sustainable economic growth, whilst all the time encouraging better health and safer travel for all. And each and every one of the objectives outlined in Transport Scotland's long-term vision for active travel is an important metric for the health of our society. And the plans laid out in the Transport Scotland proposal provide actionable goals for improvement. However, we should also be mindful of the fact that government alone won't deliver the objectives of an active travel nation. Personal responsibility plays a crucial role too, as does the third sector. Charities such as Paths for All, Cycling Scotland, Sustrans and Ramblers Scotland, to name but a few, work incredibly hard to promote these salient and important issues. For example, Cycling UK's Play on Pedals project supports every preschool child in Glasgow to learn how to ride a bike. And I'd like to briefly turn to some of the points raised by colleagues across the chamber. It's been an excellent debate, replete with lots of travel jokes and cycling puns. Um, but in particular, um, I I'd like to draw attention to Jamie Green, who made a measured uh, opening for my party, set out a number of concerns, which is appropriate to lay out despite his general tone of consensus and support for what the Scottish Government is trying to do here. And we will be supporting the Scottish Government's motion tonight. Brian Whittle spoke of imaginative schemes in his region, the Park and Stride in East Ayrshire for school children and the active travel hub at Kilmarnock Railway Station. Liam Kerr spoke of the difficulty of cycling in Edinburgh con contrasted with London and he also spoke about his uh, issue in terms of cycle tourism and as someone who travels on the trains to the West Highlands relatively frequently I'm particularly aware of the difficulties cyclists have uh, uh, of, of travel on, on trains. Finlay Carson, whom I'm delighted to see I actually saw cycling into Parliament this morning, um, spoke about the need to change attitudes. Claudia Beamish, about the importance... <laughs> Bruce Crawford, persistence rewarded. Finlay Carson, in his own contribution, suggested that the UK government was doing better than the Scottish government when it came to cycling. Would the member therefore agree with the, the head of Cycling UK when he said, once again, we're seeing Scotland setting the high bar and this time on active travel, Cycling UK would urge England, Wales and Ireland to look at their own public health and environment commitments and follow Scotland's own tracks. Donald Cameron. I, I certainly, I, I, I've, I've no issue, no issues um, celebrating Scotland's achievements, um, but I, I would also note that a lot of money has been spent in England and Wales on cycling. I was talking of Claudia Beamish's contribution and the importance of collaboration between agencies uh, and also a Rhoda Grant who spoke about road safety. And John Finney made the very important point that um, travel to school, we have seen the number of, of casualties uh, plunging and, and how important road safety is in, in rural areas. Mike Rumbles spoke of the need for leadership and action in light of the fact we will almost certainly miss the 10% the cycling target. Um, Gillian Martin made two very uh, important points. Firstly, about mental health and the happiness that she felt uh, no longer walking, uh, sorry, no longer travelling or stuck in traffic, uh, but walking to Parliament three days a week. And she also uh, made the point that it's often assumed that in, in rural areas there isn't a problem with cycling routes because there are tracks and roads, etc. Uh, and it's assumed that it's easy simply because it's not uh, in an urban setting. Um, there are concerns. Um, I don't have long to lay them out, but it is evident from statistics that Scots who drove to work five years ago at 98% are still driving to work and there's clearly a lot more to be done and we are seeing a worrying trend in the number of commuters who switch back to driving uh, as opposed to cycling. 
We need to get more people work, walking, not just to work, but out and about in some of Scotland's excellent walking routes, such as the Great Glen Way, uh, and the Great, both it and the Great Glen Cycle Route go past uh, my front door, an area that John Finney will know well, given that he grew up there. Um, and we broadly welcome to, uh, the Scottish Government's motion today, but we must be mindful that after 10 years, insufficient progress has been made, and we need to do much more to ensure that what we speak about today isn't just lost in the ether, and we need to drive forward an agenda that gets more people walking and cycling, because those simple things, above all, Deputy Presiding Officer, will have a dramatic effect in improving some of our nation's greatest ills. Uh, thank you. I call on Aileen Campbell to close the Government Minister till five o'clock, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm delighted to close today's debate on behalf of uh, the Government. I was also delighted to hear Stuart Stevenson get Raup onto the official report because it was a farm Raup that I got my first bike uh, as a, a child, so thank you for getting that onto the OR. But it's important that Humza Yousaf led, and I'm closing, as it symbolises the fact that getting people active doesn't just fit into one ministerial portfolio. As I've often said, life doesn't neatly fit into one ministerial job. That's why it's important in a country of five million, that we work together, that we collaborate and that we innovate where we can for the benefit of the whole country. And that's why the increase in funding for active travel from 40 million to 80 million is important. It gives us all an opportunity to ramp up momentum in getting the infrastructure right that helps nudge people towards taking an active travel option. This investment aids my commitment to build an active and healthier Scotland, but also helps uh, Rosanna Cunningham with her climate change efforts, Maureen Watt with her mental health brief, and it helps us create that fairer country that we all seek to see, recognising absolutely the points raised by many of the members from the Labour Party around transport poverty. And while Brian Whittle didn't necessarily consider us joined up and is critical often of this government uh, on the part of inequality and the fairnesses that he, he seeks to uh, uh, reduce, I wonder if he is as critical of his own UK government colleagues and is as passionate about creating a fairer country uh, as he is here with his colleagues down south which perpetrate and peddle many of the inequalities that we see in our uh, society. This debate, though, is rightly, uh, uh, is rightly interlinked. This debate is rightly interlinked uh, with input essential from planning, from housing, from third sector organisations, from local authorities, and most importantly of all, our communities. We need to see our communities empowered and enabled to create the spaces and the places they live in to be as good as they possibly can be. And those were points that were made by uh, Neil Bibby, by Mike Rumbles himself, John Finney, Gillian Martin, and many others. Mike Rumbles. The intervention. Could you just outline whether the Scottish Government does believe that every school child should have the opportunity to benefit from cycle training, not being in a prescriptive way, but they should have the opportunity to do so? Minister. We should have the opportunity and we uh, indicate uh, to him that we in want to support his uh, motion and also take cognizance of many of the points that he made around confidence and other uh, issues that he articulated through his contribution. But while it is right to challenge the government to do more and focus on other things that we should be doing, I think it's also fair to say that the large thrust of this debate has been consensual with the recognition that with this increased funding that we should use it as an opportunity to consider approaches that are impactful, that are cognizant of uh, local existing infrastructure projects, that encourages that behavioural change that people have uh, sought to uh, bring about, that it focuses on education in the early years to establish good healthy habits, and also to recognise the particular needs of our rural communities. We have had, a, but we do have, I would uh, say, a good basis from which to build from. Cycling as a main mode of travel to work for adult, adults in Scotland has increased. The distance travelled by cycle has also increased. Bikeability has increased its participant numbers and the amount of on-road cycling uh, tra uh, training has increased in our schools. Uh, we also see through the Hands Up survey 50% of our school children travelling to school actively. And to those who were critical of our funding, let me say again that whilst recognising the space needed to uh, critique our approach, our spend on cycling and walking is almost quadruple what we inherited in 2006-07.
And while much has been also said about, I think particularly from John Finney of so-called vanity projects, in the not too distant past, he himself recognised the importance of this government's commitment to rebuild the infrastructure of this nation. And I hope he recognises it when he also said in the past where opposition parties have spent years grumbling, the SNP is the only party to take action. Absolutely. Would the Minister recognise it? The issue of modal shift, that the, there is not comparable spend in the Highland Main Line, for instance, that there is on the A9, or likewise in Aberdeen Inverness. And unless it's properly addressed, you're going to see movement from rail to road. And that's not in the government's interest, presumably. Minister. We're seeking to bring about a positive modal shift. But again, you know, this is the point. We have rebuilt the infrastructure of our country. And he said in the past, where opposition parties have spent years grumbling, the SNP has taken action. But of course we recognise there's also more that we need to do to improve active travel. So on the issue of segregated routes, points raised by Liam Kerr and Marie Todd, uh, that was uh, outlined in Hamza Yusuf's uh, opening remarks about the Community Links Plus pro uh, projects, recognising the importance of making these segregated paths accessible as possible. And it's important to note that in the past, those uh, projects uh, have been oversubscribed. I, can un I must make some progress um, members also mentioned confidence, reaching out to other groups to encourage cycling. And I agree that why hearing from so many mammals, uh, middle-aged men at Lycra, is good. We also need to dispel the myths that to cycle you need Lycra. It doesn't necessarily help to normalise cycling or cycling to work if you have to have that special gear. And that's why projects like Bikeability, Pedal for Scotland, the Cycle Friendly Awards, uh, Operation Close Pass are so crucial. It's why the first two years of the rail franchise that there's been 1,269 cycling spaces have been developed at 44 stations. That's why ScotRail intend to roll out a further 800 spaces at stations and why the bike and go uh, hire schemes are rolled out across uh, 12 stations. And work is ongoing to ensure that we can use that opportunity of the high speed, speed rail work network to ensure further opportunity to embed uh, cycling. And I don't know whether that makes us a hero in Liam Kerr's eyes or not, but certainly we'll always seek to uh, do what we can. Um, I had the pleasure, though, last week of meeting internationally around planning expert Brett Tondorin, who attended the recent Paths for All uh, AGM. And Paths for All, presiding officer, given that so many people talked about the importance of walking, should be absolutely credited with helping to see that increase we are seeing in recreational walking. But the reason I mention uh, Brent is because his ethos was to create multimodal cities, multimodal citizens, uh, making walking, biking and transit des delightful. Because if you design a city for cars, it feels for everyone, including drivers. If you build a multimodal city, it works better for everybody, including drivers. Trying to ease that tension that I think was articulated by Rhoda Grant in her uh, uh, remarks. Many members have also mentioned fantastic local projects, Beat the Street, Ramblers, uh, Crawford's endeavour to link into the walkways around them, assets and capac capacity in our communities that we must allow to flourish and permit to flourish to bring about that shift that we all seek uh, to see happening. So uh, to close, uh, Presiding Officer, Brent also recently tweeted about this being Halloween. His point being about whether or not ensuring tonight when children are about to go out in guise, whether they have the spaces and, and, and the streets that are there designed well enough to encourage walking to be safe and whether they are encouraged to regularly walk beyond just this one opportunity we have tonight to see our children out uh, guise. And that's why we need to plan good quality places so that the next generation can pursue active lives. And again, this is just the opening up of this dialogue. But again, what's really important is that across the political party, in this parliament, we have agreement that this is the right thing to do and we'll continue on that basis. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes our debate on the promotion of active travel in Scotland and we move to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 8497.2 in the name of Jamie Green, which seeks to amend Motion 8497 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the promotion of active travel in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a uh, vote and members may cast their votes now.
question of the terminal. The result of the vote on amendment number 8497.2 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 55, no, 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I don't think the member's vote um, would have made a difference there. And if there's any doubt, could you check afterwards that it was recorded? I don't think it would have affected the outcome. And I think it should have been recorded because there's 113. The next question is that amendment 8497.4 in the name of Neil Bibby, which seeks to amend motion 8497 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the promotion of active travel in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that amendment 8497.3 in the name of John Finney, which seeks to amend motion 8497 be agreed. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 8497.3 in the name of John Finney is yes, six, no, 108. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that amendment 8497.1 in the name of Mike Rumbles, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Hamza Youssef be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question. <laughs> the... The final question is that motion 8497 in the name of Hamza Youssef as amended on the promotion of active travel in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Ben McPherson. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.